Without objection. Thanks, Mr. President. Pending before the United States Senate is the nomination of Daryl Papillon. The Eastern District Court judge wishes to be for Louisiana. I want to say a word about this nomination because uh, it, it indicates a positive development in the Senate Judiciary Committee, which the presiding officer and I share uh, membership in, in the fact that this is a bipartisan nomination. On May 11th, Daryl Papillon was voted out of the committee by a vote of 15 to 6. Senators on the Republican side, Graham, Cornyn, Kennedy, and Tillis, joined all committee Democrats in voting for this nominee. He received a unanimous rating of well-qualified from the American Bar Association, and he has the obvious support of the two Louisiana senators, Cassidy and Kennedy, both of whom returned positive blue slips, which is a committee process, and both of whom are Republican. Papillon had a BA from Louisiana State University and a JD from LSU's Paul Herbert Law Center before clerking for, clerking for Associate Justice Catherine Kimball on the Louisiana Supreme Court. He entered private practice in New Orleans where he specialized in the defense of products liability actions. And since moving to Baton Rouge in 1999, Papillon's main areas of practice have been personal injury and wrongful death litigation. Papillon has tried at least 33 cases to verdict, including more than a dozen jury trials. He's been a special prosecutor for the East Baton Rouge District Attorney's Office and a mediator for mediation cases in South Louisiana. He served as a special master in state court on three different occasions. He's deeply involved in the Louisiana legal community, having served as president of both the Louisiana State Bar Association and the Baton Rouge Bar Association. Let me repeat that. President of the Louisiana State Bar Association. The committee received several letters of support about, from individuals and organizations in his, on his behalf. The former president of the Louisiana State Bar Association, the former president of the New Orleans Bar Association, six former opposing counsels, and treasurers of the New Orleans chapter of the Federal Bar Association. The reason I read that in detail is because if I went back home to Illinois, like I did last week, and told people we're considering judges before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I chair, their first reaction is, can't you find a judge that both Democrats and Republicans agree on? Here's one. He wouldn't be here before us today, but for the fact that two Republican senators from Louisiana reached an agreement with the Biden White House for this man to have a lifetime appointment to the federal bench. Now, in case that sounds like front page news, it happens, and it happens more often than not. And the reason I come to the floor at this moment is to make sure it's a matter of record. During the Trump administration, Democrats approve what we call blue slips for 120 nominees for federal court. Some of those were two Democratic senators in a state like Illinois, but there was a level of negotiation and cooperation. I had, a senior senator from Illinois, I had to sit down with the legal counsel from President Trump's White House and put nominees on the table saying, here's one that we want and here's one that you want. I think we can agree on those two. Let's move forward. And we did it. That happened, as I said, over 120 times with Democratic senators working with the Trump White House. We filled all of the vacancies in Illinois, virtually all of them, during the Trump administration with that bipartisan agreement. Today we have another one, two Republican senators with a Democratic president. It happens. And for it to happen, you need two things. The will for members to move and put nominees on the bench. And secondly, a person so qualified that both sides don't feel they'll be embarrassed by them. They're more judges and attorneys than they are politicians. And in this case, I think we found just that kind of nominee. Now we have a lot more to go. There are roughly 87 uh, pending vacancies in the district courts across the nation. About um, almost half of them are in states with two Democratic senators, and the other half in states with at least one Republican, maybe two Republican senators. We're trying to reach a point where we have an agreement on this, and I think we can do it. 
This is an indication, and other, I could list some other senators that I'm working with on the Republican side to fill those vacancies as well. I think that's what the American people are looking for, more evidence that we're trying to find some common ground despite the obvious political differences in this nation. Uh, this is an issue that I think uh, is timely, and I wanted to bring the attention of the Senate uh, to it on the floor this, this afternoon. Mr. President, when I went home to Illinois, I can't tell you how many people who know that I chair the Judiciary Committee ask me, what's going on with the United States Supreme Court? Obvious question, because in the last few weeks, there have been disclosures about at least one justice on the court that have raised some serious questions. Justices have an important job to fill as one of the major branches of our government. They'll be issuing their remaining decisions for this term, and they'll recess soon until they reconvene in October. But the debate is still going to continue, even if they're not sitting in the court across the street. How will the justices spend their time during these several months when they're not in session? That's really the question. Rest up, possibly, or spend time with their family, possibly, or maybe take a trip or two. There we have a question that is timely. We've learned through recent investigative reporting that some Supreme Court justices on the highest court in the land have enjoyed lavish travel during their summer, summer months. That travel was often paid for by others, and the justices, in some cases, did not disclose this free travel as are required by law. These are the justices on the highest court in land, and the question is whether they're following the law. They impose legal obligations on citizens across America. Are they living by the same legal, legal obligations that affect them as justices? It's a pretty obvious question. Most notably, ProPublica recently found that in June 2019, after the court issued its final opinion that term, Justice Clarence Thomas boarded a private jet and flew to Indonesia. Then the justice and his wife spent nine days island hopping through the South Pacific on a yacht that was 162 foot long. ProPublica estimated the cost of chartering the plane and yacht at more than half a million dollars. But Justice Thomas didn't pay for that. The travel and trip were provided by a billionaire real estate developer, Harlan Crow, and several corporate entities in Crow's business empire. This is just one example of the largesse provided to Justice Thomas by Mr. Crow and his businesses. It's also been reported that Justice has regularly spent time at a luxury retreat in the Adirondacks owned by one of Mr. Crow's companies, again, free of charge. Mr. Crow has also bought real estate owned by Justice Thomas, including the home in which his mother lives. And Mr. Crow even paid for private school tuition for one of the justice's relatives. Justice Thomas did not disclose any of these gifts or travel or lodging or other benefits. Now let me say at the outset, Justice Thomas is not the only Supreme Court justice, past or present, who's accepted gifts of free travel and failed to disclose them in a timely manner. But the scope and scale of the undisclosed Justice Thomas gifts has gone far beyond anything else we've ever seen. And this highlights the enormous gap in the ethical standards for the Supreme Court justices. We've known this for years. In February of 2012, 11 years ago, I first wrote to Chief Justice Roberts and urged him to adopt a code of ethics, ethical conduct, to bind the justices just like the code that binds every other federal judge in America. Chief Justice Roberts failed to act when I wrote him 11 years ago. Since then, the court's ethics problems have just gotten worse. Last month, after ProPublica published its first report on Justice Thomas' undisclosed travel, I renewed, I renewed my call for Chief Justice Roberts to clean up the ethical mess across the street. And I invited him, personally invited him, to testify at a hearing before our Senate Judiciary Committee so he could speak directly to the American people. You say, wait a minute, how many times does a Supreme Court justice come across the street and formally appear before Congress? Well, it turns out 92 different times since the year 1960. 92 different times. So they come across the street when they have something to tell us. I think they should be coming across the street to discuss the ethics of the court. This would have been an opportunity for the Chief Justice to reassure the American people 
and start to restore trust us in the high court. I watch some of those news programs on Sunday morning. I'm a typical politician. And they have the polling data of what people think of the Supreme Court. The numbers are bad. They're almost as bad as Congress. And the fact is, they can do something about it, and they should. This court's trust in this court has fallen to the lowest level in 50 years. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court's Chief Justice didn't accept my invitation to walk across the street. Time and again, again, I've made clear one point I want to make clear today. The Chief Justice, John Roberts, has the ability right now, the authority right now, to impose higher ethical standards on his fellow justices, standards that would be transparent and enforceable. Wouldn't that be refreshing? He could take that action today, but for some reason so far, he has declined the opportunity. And if he won't act, Congress must. We cannot tolerate a system in which the highest court in America has the lowest ethical standards in the federal government. And we certainly should not begin another Supreme Court summer recess where justices can take free trips and travel under an inadequate set of ethics rules. Last week, Chief Justice Roberts gave a speech and he said something encouraging, I quote, he said, I want to assure people that I'm committed to making certain that we as a court adhere to the highest standards of conduct. He said, we are continuing to look at things we can do to give practical effect to that commitment. While I appreciate the Chief Justice's commitment, the fact is we need action, and he doesn't need to look far, for, far away for solutions. We have known for years what the court needs, binding rules and enforcement mechanisms, just like every other federal judge has operated under for a decade. If every other federal judge has ethical standards and disclosures, why does the Chief Justice for the highest court in the land not have at least those levels of uh, ethical standards, but even higher? The Senate Judiciary Committee has the responsibility to exercise oversight over the federal judiciary. We take it seriously. We have held two ethics reform hearings so far this year, and soon we'll consider legislation to restore trust in the high court. When billionaires and other people with interest before the court try to make friends with the justices through gifts and luxury giveaways, and when they obtain special private access to these justices for themselves and their, others, their other friends, it's a serious problem. At minimum, it creates an appearance of undue influence that erodes the public's trust in court impartiality. And we don't yet know the full extent of the benefits that Harlan Crow and his company gave to Justice Thomas and his family. Nor do we know yet how many other people and companies with interest before the courts may have gotten special private access to Justice Thomas or some other justice through trips and lodging that people like Harlan Crow have sponsored. My Democratic colleagues on the Senate Judiciary Committee and I sent a letter to Mr. Crow and the three companies that we think sponsored the trips for Justice Thomas. We asked him, tell us about the gifts. Tell us about the access of people to Justice Thomas during this hospitality uh, extravaganza. The information would be valuable for us in writing a law for the ethics standards of the court. Mr. Crow responded through his attorney last week with a letter that took some astonishing legal positions. He basically claimed that Congress lacks the authority to either legislate or conduct oversight when it comes to the Supreme Court's ethics. He also tried to assert separation of powers as an excuse not to answer our questions. Of course, Congress has enacted many ethics laws that apply to the justices, including a law we passed just last year, bipartisan law sponsored by a Democratic and Republican senator on, a, on stock transaction reporting. The justices have announced they're going to follow those laws. And Mr. Crow is a private citizen, not a branch of government. He can't claim separation of powers as a reason not to provide information pursuant to a congressional oversight request. He's a businessman. He's not a branch of government. If Mr. Crow is convinced he's done nothing wrong, what does he have to hide? Senator Whitehouse, the chair of the federal court subcommittee, and I responded to Mr. Crow last week, informed them that he still has until next Monday, June 5th, to provide the information we requested. As I mentioned, we'll soon be considering legislation in the committee and his information could be helpful in our legislative effort. Let me close by reiterating that Chief Justice Roberts 
does not have to wait on Harlan Crow or Congress. He can clean up this mess today by adopting a resolution binding the justices to higher ethical standards. This is the Roberts Court. History is going to write the history of the Supreme Court in the name of this Chief Justice. It happens all the time. He is going to be known as the Chief Justice who ignored an ethical challenge that went to the heart of the integrity of the court, or as the Chief Justice who finally responded in a historic manner to do the right thing for disclosing to the American people exactly what the conduct is of his justices. Chief Justice Roberts has known for more than 10 years that this is a problem and the solution is within his authority. He should act before the end of this Supreme Court term. Don't leave this hanging. Don't leave town. Leave Washington, all these chief, the justices of the court, unresolved. I honestly believe, whether I voted for them or not, that there are justices in that court who are uneasy and uncomfortable with the current state of affairs. They are trying their level best to follow the law, and they can't explain why others are not. They want to have an opportunity to prove their own reputations and their own integrity, and they should. The Chief Justice should be listening to them, and I hope he is. It's the Chief Justice and the court's time to act. If they don't, we will. Mr. President, I yield the floor.